WebGL other than optimization. So, working on that. Hey, no pens. Hello. Greetings and salutations. Hey, Taggart. Wow, this, you know, for pre six o'clock, this is uh, a good number. <laughs> Normally, we hit critical mass closer to like six six fifteen ish. Hey, Doctor Fried Parts. All right. I think you're um, you're not on mute, but I don't know if it's got your audio set up right in Discord. And then oh, yeah, there's Dag. Hey, Dag. Hey. hey. Are you back home or are you uh, still on the road? Hey. Been there and gone again. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm in New Jersey this this week. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> depends on what part of New Jersey. To be fair, um, you mean you mean the part of New Jersey that's not in New Jersey, right? <laughs> right. Like they say, the '60s happened in the early '70s. Um, you know. <laughs> So, all right. Well, it's a little, that's after six o'clock. Let's rock and roll. Um, now, uh, Syntax, I don't know if this lines up uh, with the way the normal schedule is. The Syntax had actually come up with the idea of doing themed discussions that were, you know, paced throughout the month. Um, we've kept them pretty open and chatty and, and just kind of covering a bunch of different things. But um, there have been a lot of discussions about bridge building lately. Um, Dr. Fried Pants has, uh, has, uh, come, I, I keep wanting to say Dr. Fried Pants, by the way. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's just my, my, psycho my psychosis, but we'll, we'll move on. Um, um, oh, hey there, Electric Lad. It does so, so bottom line is, like, we've had a lot of discussion about bridge building and, and discussions about panels and things like that. So, um felt like this was a good time to go ahead and, and actually kind of dive into some of those uh, topics. Uh, and really, there's a lot of healthy discussion about two different, there's two different types of bridges is what I would say. There's the portable methodology. Um, and then, oh, hey, Hemacast, welcome guys. So there's the portable bridge set up. And, and if need be, by the way, I'm gonna actually, I'll actually put my portable um, server rig up here to kind of do a show and tell if we want to go there. But there's the portable methodology and then there's the, you know, permanent bridges, like something you're building, you know, in a room or in a facility or in your, you know, your, uh, your workshop that's got, it's not really meant to move around. You might, you might stow it, but it's not meant to travel uh, in the traditional sense. Um, and this is, and by the way, uh, for those of you that haven't joined these before, um, I do tend to talk a lot. That is not intentional. Uh, this is meant to be a community chat. So like everyone's welcome to participate in chat. Uh, but what I was gonna say is I feel like the portable bridges and those constructs are probably what most people are interested in. Is that a fair comment? No. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I I don't know if I'm in the minority here, um, but I know that I'm looking more at what would fall under the location-based entertainment category. That's what I'm going to be building here at my house. I'm also interested in the portable bridges, um, you know, for conventions and stuff in the area. But uh, but and and I think there's a lot of crossover too, as far as you know, building custom controllers and finding the right 
touch screens and those kinds of things that are going to fall in both categories. Right, right. And I think the the portable. Uh, so I think that's a fair distinction because I think the portable side of things is literally the stow and go aspect, right? Um, not in so much that the technology has to be different, but how can the technology be uh, made to be easily portable and and to some degree potentially more durable, right? At least the casings and or way the technology is stored. Um, you know, I use Gator like for the I use Gator cases as uh, for um, the server rack that travels that rolls, and then I use um, uh, different cases for the storing the monitors. But basically, everything rolls. Um, so let, let's let's take Taggart's kind of tact on this, and just let's just talk technology then, regardless of permanent versus mobile. And if we happen to drift into one or the other, that's great. Um, and, I was just going uh, to weigh in here on that permanent versus mobile thing. I mean, just to, to give you the real-world perspective, um, the, the whole idea of what I guess you guys classify as permanent bridges is sort of gone out of favor in actual like uh, vehicle construction. Now the buzzword is modularity, which is much more like uh, a portable bridge, namely that all of the equipment is considered, you know... Uh, installable so it's built as a self-contained unit using common interfaces among components so that when you build say an airplane or a submarine control room or in the current ford class carriers the rooms literally have no pre-assigned function they just they run power they run data they run ventilation and then you know they have standard you know 19 inch equipment specifications and the equipment is just slotted in per purpose so I think that that architecture approach probably serves us all well, you know, when building these kinds of things where the only difference between, say, a permanent bridge and a portable one would be, uh, you know, how big are the screws you use to anchor the thing down to your desk, right? Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's interesting you bring the, the Ford class. Um, for those of you who don't know, I live in uh, Newport News, Virginia, which is where they build the carriers. Um, so I have a lot of friends uh, that work on the different carriers that are built. And the Ford class was a, quite a challenge in that modularity uh, because what they did was they designed it, it pretty much exactly as you described, right? Everything was built to kind of plug in. And then they did the cable runs. And the cable runs were pre-constructed with their you know, terminations on either end with basically doing you know essentially hyper cad like cad drawings but like they would figure out all the the turns and twists that a cable needed to make and okay it has to be this long and the most common thing they ran into is cables would be up to a foot to two feet too short because they would run from one end of the carrier to the other and the computer was wrong on the the way the cable would bend and it was losing uh it's you know some of its length every time it bent but the computer calculation didn't take that into account and so every almost every I, i'm i'm stating this third hand but every almost every cable run that was of a decent length had to be redone for the for the first carrier um because of that <laughs> um it's a little anecdote but uh but to, to your point i i think that's uh quite well and Really, why I brought up the two different bridge types is, you know, anything I'm going to be using is going to be um, modular slash portable in nature. It's literally going to be something that's loaded into a, a vehicle to be taken somewhere. Uh, whereas something Taggart might build, or who's uh, he's not with us, but uh, Tim Prickett, who built a permanent, he literally built a, a permanent bridge in his uh, the top of his workshop. Um, that one's literally the definition of permanent. So the only way that's coming out is with a with a hammer and and uh, and some other things. So talking tech, I, I think it's fair to say the the interface of choice for at least the core interface is touchscreen, right? Considering the interface ha is web based in its design, but I think all of us have a desire to have some level of tactile interaction with an interface, right? And uh, Fried Parts, you, you posted a picture of the, I don't know if that was the 11, but it's certainly one of the Apollo capsules uh, and its um, its layout. And so everybody loves flipping switches and, and whatnot. And the original console design that we built that was, again, portable, but it was a flight and tactical kind of merged together as a portable console. 
Uh, we never did it, but we wanted to have uh, buttons along the top for things like a, a, a covered secure button for things like a eject, you know, and not having those kinds of fun things. While a touchscreen is great, the tactile nature of certain buttons, uh, just you, you can't replace it with a touchscreen. Um, there, there are some HMI factors that go into when you put a function on a physical button as well in the real world. And uh, I mean, obviously, things like motion don't play in, you know, your ability to touch it, use a touch screen under under physical motion is is constrained. But more, you know, perhaps the analogy for us might be, you know, somebody who's got a shaky finger because the red alert clacks on is blaring in their head, you know, and they don't touch accurately. Um, but there are some interface uh, speed issues, too. Like, for example, you want to eject. You don't want to be searching on a screen for a button. You want to just smash the big red knob in front of you. Yeah. Yeah, SCE to AUX. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, right. But also, you get um, to the point about security, and I was mentioning it, you can have interfaces that are, have intentional safe, literal covers, right, for safety. Um, and while in what we're talking about here with a spaceship simulation, it's more for fun, um, it still adds that layer of, you know, there's, there's a two-step motion to triggering a particular function. Um, what, uh, I'll stop right now and like, where do we want to lead this? Uh, there, there's so many directions we can go with this. Um, you know, I, I can gladly talk on and on about what we've done so far with, on the convention side, but I think that would not serve the purpose. Lee, what are your thoughts? I know you typically. Oh, you're muted. I was uh, just dealing with somebody that came in, so I turned myself off and I didn't hear what the last five minutes was. Fair enough. Never mind then. I thought you were uh, popping back on camera to chime in. We were just talking about, I, I kind of started us off with portable versus you know permanent. I think you were here for that part. But then um, oh. Dr. Fried Parts really kind of talked about the modularity of the cores that have plenty of overlap. Um, and so who, let me ask this question, who here that is present has either worked on, built, or is planning to build a bridge of any kind? Me. One, three, four, five. Same, yeah. <laughs> well, all right. Um, so everybody to some degree. So l let's focus on that course. So. I think I'm correct, except for Lee. Lee's actually done it. Unfortunately, Lee's is in storage right now. Um, he's posted pictures of his setup, which is more of a, you know, the, the rack system, which uh, aligns Dr. Fry parts closer to what some of the pictures you posted, that kind of uh, utilitarian style. Um, do we want to talk about, I, I, I'm really letting us leave. Do we want to talk about interface design? Uh, not, I mean, I'm not talking about, the interface of the web more the interface. I was going to mention that you know, like when we when we have these discussions about like control panel, you know, layouts or designs or control room designs, which is ultimately what a bridge really is. Um, the the basic hierarchy is you usually begin with a layout, like an overall general plan of you know what stations are where and what where the functions are and how the functions relate to each other, and then you step into the design of the individual stations and then to the design of the controls themselves. Um, I, I could, I don't know how much pedantic, you know, real world stuff we want to drag in, you know, day job we want to drag in here into our fantasy play, but but the broad, the broad thing is, yeah. Go for it. Uh, seriously, go for it. So, so in control well, room. Can I, if I can, sorry, just really quick. I, I, I want to hear what you have to say, uh, but, but I just wanted, because you mentioned it, there's also the flip side of the more dramatic, the big red button, the big warp throttle handle to be, you know, for, for gamification, some of these things want to be bigger and more dramatic. So I can slam that button and win the, win the game sort of thing. So there's the two sides to it, but sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, and actually, oh, and I, I'm going to add one anecdotal thing to that, and then and then we're, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Dr. Freiparts. So, uh, talking about gamification, there is a, uh, I, for those of you who don't know, I, I do a lot of the escape room industry. Um, I work with about 180 escape room facilities worldwide. And one did a Starship uh, escape where they put, literally, you, the first room you walk in, there's a button that is five inches in diameter, okay, giant, with, with, and it just kind of glows like this. And around it, it says, do not touch. It says, do not touch. Okay. And it's glowing. And then you see, right. 
And and so the the psychological thing you get watching people play is you'll have two groups. You'll have one, group number one, which will not touch it no matter what. They can't, you know, no matter how far in the room they have or haven't come from, they, they will not touch it. They are terrified. And then That's, the other group. They're, they're, they're accountants in real life. <laughs> yeah, right. But the first thing other groups do, well, they'll, they'll walk in and go. <laughs> they'll just hit it right away. Um, but what that button would do, it, it had nothing to do with solving the room. It was there to really just mess with them. But if they pressed it, the computer would come on and say, you really shouldn't have done that. Everything in the room goes off. And then you hear an alien scale across the ceiling. And then they have a fog effect with a scream to come down over top of where the button was. And that's all it does. It's just there for fun. Um, and uh, that's I really wanted to bring up that anecdotal part because Taggart's point is valid. And the last bit I'll do, and I'm going to shut up, is the best occurrence of this I ever saw was there a bunch of kids playing and a dad who was kind of playing, but really just there to chaperone. They're playing this room and he's standing right, right by where the, the fog and everything comes down. And he said, and one of the kids, they're, they're all terrified to push it. One of them in the middle of playing just runs up and smacks it. And all the stuff happens. The kids are screaming. The dad never budges. He's just standing there, hands in his pockets, and he's just kind of like, uh, and they're screaming and he's just not moving. And then the fog, and then the, the fog comes down and the scream comes down. And this is his entire reaction. <laughs> it was just, it was just kind of like, you know, the, the, like the, the final straw for the dad watching the kids. <laughs> was he got he got dumped on with fog. Um, so great, Angela. Okay, I'm stopping. Fried parts, you're up. Okay, yeah. So I, I to that point, I I completely agree, right? Um, I I basically have two. Uh, broad uh interests or, or or frustrations i should say with um you know the the very everyone's very first myself included first attempt at at bridge building or, or control panels or whatever right and that is we, we do two things one is we make them you know sort of a flat board with buttons on it so it's not real enough so it's sort of immersion breaking and the other thing is that we don't actually get enough density control density information density to to make things realistic like you have a giant board with like three big buttons on it um which which you actually get more fun more immersion whatever if you have instead of three big buttons you have you know eight big buttons and it really fills up the panel and you get more functions out there so a lot of my interest in taking you know the real world stuff into the into the bridge building experiences is, is to get more immersion more tactile response more play you know out of what we would consider our traditional you know simplistic flat panel um, but that aside uh, layout architectures there are broadly two in modern usage um, the the most common one we see nowadays is called linear or sometimes called auditorium style. You see this sort of like the NASA, uh, you know, Apollo era and forward all went with this kind of linear benches array looking at a big screen in front of everyone. Um, and I think that's sort of the, the default observation of how to build, a, a, you know, an Artemis, a Starship Horizons kind of layout, right? Because it's it's the most sense. Everyone's on a couch. You put a big screen in front of you. You put laptops in your lap. It's that basic linear layout. Um, the other one that's in common use is called conformal, uh, which you could imagine is more like a, a U or an L shape, where the stations are wrapped around the perimeter of the room uh, with some kind of you know commanding officer or, or central navigation or observation station in the middle with a forward you know view screen or uh, situational display. Um, and those are the 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 latter style, the conformal style is used mostly when space is constrained, like you know submarines, uh, command combat information centers deep inside the hearts of you know ships, uh, engineering rooms in you know commercial vessels in maritime applications. Um, and uh, the linear style is more used when space is less constrained. Like so, for example, I mean SpaceX takes this linear layout to an extreme. I mean they basically just put a bunch of IKEA tables with laptops on it, and you know project a giant display overhead, and it's very unimpressive. Um, what they're you know it doesn't it doesn't have that NASA you know like we're doing serious work kind of vibe. Um, but but that's the 
you know, the, that's the sort of the two layout architectures. And, and I think that that's the most important decision you're going to make in terms of your control panels, because if you have a conformal layout, then your control, you, you are constrained in width, like your stations need to be narrower, but you are less constrained vertically. So you're going to stack displays or turn your display vertically, put controls next to it on the sides. Uh, if you're using a linear layout, then typically your objective is to see over the top of your station to the situational display because it's going to be in front of you and you're less constrained in width and therefore more constrained in height. Um, so sort of making that decision early is, is going to be very important. Um, and um, Oh, go ahead, Lance. Well, and I would say just plain bridge sims in general. It's interesting you bring that up. I, I'll do a quick aside and then flip it back over to you, uh, Dr. Fried. But um, we actually had this discussion. We were just at MAGFest. We ran three regular bridges and we ran the deluxe bridge for the, the LARP experience as well. And the, our normal configuration is essentially a V like this, where you have the, the projector here and then they're, they're spread out like, and the captain's in the middle and that's your, your V formation for, for your smaller, uh, a bridge that would fit in a 10 by 10 space, okay? Um, now with the captain being there, he can he or she can do exactly what we he was just describing, which is they can, they can like lean over and look at the flight station. They can get up and kind of walk back and forth and, and to be blunt, micromanage their officers. So we actually did something with the deluxe ex experience is we had two, we had flight and tactical up front and then the others were behind the captain. And then we also instructed the captain to remain seated. So that was a conscious choice. And we said, nope, we want you relying on your officers. And, you know, if you need to get data from them, you need to, you know, communication is key. And, uh, and I would ask Hemacast and even uh, Heatmiser to kind of chime in on this from AgFest's perspective. But I think we found they were far more efficient as a team by following that rule. What, would you guys agree with that? Except for the drunk bridge. Except for the drunk bridge. <laughs> when you're like, yeah, that's yeah, no. <laughs> they did have some good pirate juice, though. And I think you hit on it there. The captain, and I mean, we're not talking about bridge building, but the, this it does apply to what we're talking about because when the captain is focused with one person only and they're standing over their shoulder, like you said, they're not paying attention to the other stations, and things can get missed. So, yeah, um, but interesting call out, Lance. Like, uh, let's let's keep rolling. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So if um... You know, when, at least in my applications, um, we almost always deal with conformal vertical styles stations because they they fit more tightly into the limited space available for control rooms. So, uh, for example, um, currently we're working on a control plant 
design for a, a plastics facility that makes um, you know melt blown polypropylene filters for face masks. So essentially, the the material that's inside this stuff that does the filtration, um, and you know in the in the design of those facilities, you want as many operators as possible to be able to physically look out and see the plant so that when they're pushing some button and turning on some massive, you know, motor or hydraulic system, like they can actually see it moving. Obviously they have the sensor data and the automation is watching it, but you want, you know, human oversight. Uh, otherwise, you know, just hit the button and go home and let the robots do their thing. Right. So, um, <laughs> uh, What's you know, by <laughs> Never goes wrong. Yeah, works all the time. Just ask your pointer. Yeah. Uh, but so the, so the issue for us is how do we get you know it, how do you pack as much you know humans into a space where they still have access broadly to the same controls or same visibility and to do that you you basically are stuck with uh, the more conformal layout um, which sits the humans closer shoulder to shoulder you know, closer together. Well, and I. Well, in typical applications, they do, right? Uh, the, the, I guess the analogy to Starship Horizons would be, you know, visibility to the main view screen. I, I, I must admit, you know, I'm a relative novice to, to the actual gameplay side of this. I, I found it because my kids were saw it at some convention. I think it was uh, Artemis or something they were using there. And uh, no, no, please. So, um, yeah, and I think there's, there's, and I was actually going to hit on that topic in a similar way, but in a slightly different, like, I think uh, the pictures that, that uh, Syntax posted in the voice chat chat channel are pictures of his bridge when, in its full glory, and it follows more of the model where there is a main view screen in that, that corner section, but it isn't necessarily intended that they sit there and stare at it all the time. It's there referentially. Right, it's not there cinematically, um, and <laughs> but you also have the main view screen replicated right, and basically in their their arc of controls and or views. Like like Fry Purse was saying, you know, I want buttons. I want lots of buttons. I want lots of tactile things. More, 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 more screens, more buttons, more interface, more positions, more things to do. More, more, more. Um, oh yeah. So. So what I did is I said, okay, I found these uh, VGA uh, ma uh, matrices on eBay. They they had them cheap. And basically, I, I plugged in the main screen plus three other screens. I think it was a center console alert status, and I don't know what the other one was. I had, I had these other screens available to the players via the switcher. So they could, if they're sitting there, they could look. Mine was in a V-shape, but a 90-degree V. And so in the middle of the V was the was the main screen, but but left and right of the players, or, or left or right or both, was this these other screens. So between you and the person next to you, you could say, okay, what do we want on this common screen between us? We've got a screen in front of us for control, a screen above us for more of the uh, uh, the iris type, uh, you know, web page type of. Uh, you know, storyline stuff, and we can take this screen between us. Do you want to make this a copy of the main? Okay, click, click, click. It's a copy of the main. Oh, we'd like to have it be shield status or alert status. Okay, click, click, click. Uh, and then to my left, what do you want this screen between us to be? Do you want that to be the main? Okay, mm -hmm. fine. So there was, so it, it gave the players uh, a few buttons to hit and a few choices to make. And so a single player had their touch screen in front of them. A touch screen in portrait mode in front of them, and two switch boxes, depends on where they were sitting, to control two auxiliary screens to give you more data. So, uh, and I want to have engineering and I want to have, you know, all, all these other screens and stuff like that, which with the event architecture that uh, Horizons has, it's all possible. Uh, we just need the screen interface 
be able to create screens faster. So, yeah, the screen designer or the, the layout designer is what you would. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, all the all the mechanics under the hood are ready to connect all the parts. We just got to have the visual, you know, uh, and and it, it's there's also there to connect all to tactile screens and knobs and buttons and dials and switches and light up toggles and all the rest of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine there's, I mean, the, the input side is almost always sort of implicitly handled because you can emulate, you know, anything you can do with a keyboard, you can make a physical button emulate that, you know, digital command. The The issue is always the output side, right? Like, if you want, you know, when you flip a button, like it lights up, or if you have an alarm or something that's going to, you know, the output from the game back to the physical enunciators, that's, that's where there needs to be some dev involvement. And, uh, you know, usually in most games that that's a, you know, a third, fourth, fifth priority, you know, tier after, after we make a gazillion bucks and EA is banging at the door to acquire us, then we'll think about making an API for the physical, you know, LARP environment. Right. So, um, I, I have a minimal API. I would not call it a full, full set API, but it, it's, it's used for the designer that exists today. But talking about like the example of flipping a switch and then having an indicator that is, <laughs> that is controlled by something, right? Like it's been being told to be turned on or off. Um, I ju just a basic example I can give you of what would work right now today is creating a series of variables inside of Horizon. So like using the variable construct to create variables and then using, and I'm just talking out loud, like you could use a Pi Zero W even with Node Red connect through MQTT and then just, or it, it wouldn't even have to be a traditional variable. It could be an MQTT value where you're setting a topic to on or off. And then that could tell, uh, you know, using a Pi, uh, you could actually then tell using the GPIO to, to turn something on or off. So there are ways to do that right now today within the design where you're not having to like ask me to add, hey, I want to have these five cool lights can you add API calls for them? You actually can use the MQTT or variable system to do that today, um, which allows. Let's we'll just interject here. This is this is why we love you. Okay, just just get on the record there. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I the, you know, I, I I've said this before. I feel very much like yes, I'm building a, a game that I want to play and I want to you know because I love starships and I love all that kind of stuff. Um, but I really view this as I'm building a platform, uh, not just a game. Because I want to use this platform for other games. I, I've said it before. I, like, I, you know, Horizons, we are getting to a really good point in its development. Um, there is a, a new roadmap coming. Uh, but there's so much we've done in the last year um, that there is going to be a point where Horizons actually gets put on the shelf. And it's like, you know, and it's it's done in its classical sense. But it'll always evolve because I want to do things like Hunter Killer, um, some kind of a, a mech style variant of the, with using this because the engine itself at its core is so capable of many different methodologies not just a starship simulator um you know that that like my mind it, it, for those of you that remember them the uh, the battle tech pods that used to exist um you know they, they, and they still live they're all privately owned now um but the tesla pods and they actually have been privately upgrading them over the years um you know, so they're even better than they were when they went off. The, but, uh, you know, I see this engine underneath Horizons as capable of allowing somebody to build their own new Tesla pod with all of the switches and all of the control panels and systems that you can do far more cost effectively today than you could 20 years ago, 30 years ago when they were building the original Tesla pods. Because you can use, you know, I mean, a an Amazon Fire tablet. A seven-inch fire tablet is not even forty dollars, and on you know if you get it at certain times of the year, it's twenty, um, and it's fully capable of running an interface. Um, and, but I'm one of those people from my background, like I'm a I'm a simulator nerd from the you know of the. I still feel like the '90s was this like grand time of simulators, uh, because you had X-wing and Tie Fighter and Wing Commander and F-15, all the microprose titles you can name. LucasArts with Secret Webs of the Luftwaffe. You had all the Mech Warrior uh, games. So all these great simulators where you know you were you had a flight stick and a throttle and pedals, and it was great. and we're seeing a renaissance in the space genre, right? Elite Dangerous and uh, yeah, fair enough. 
Yeah, Elite Dangerous, and then a game I won't mention that still hasn't officially come out and never will because they'll just get funding forever. You know, Star Citizen. Um, wait, know, wait, which game could you possibly be referring to? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, and if, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I used to. Um, I can never say I knew Chris as a friend, but I knew him in his Origin days. Um, I was friends with a lot of the Origin developers back in the '90s, and uh, if I was able to see him today, I, I'd give him a good smack. I was like, just get it out already. Finish it up. Um, you know, so at least I have an excuse. I'm a single death. <laughs> if I had millions in funding, you know, anyway, um, that's a different topic for another Tuesday. Wait, are you, um, are you advocating that we submit refund requests and then re-forward the funds to you? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, um, that's not a bad idea. No, I'm kidding. I'm joking. I'm kidding. So, but no, where, where I'm going with this is though, like talking about the platform and going back to kind of getting serious is, you know, I want people to create um, entire worlds, uh, you know, modu you know modularize where they're basically doing, it has nothing, there's not a drop of Horizons front end world building or logic or screens in it, you know, where somebody does Star Trek and Star Wars and Firefly and so, and all of it's plausible. And where I'm really excited and we're talking about interfaces and switches and stuff and the ability the engine has to do certain things like handle lighting arrays uh, and DMX and all of that is the, uh, with what we're doing with the engine lately is, and I'm kind of going off of, of bridge design for a second, but it does circle back around is I'm getting more and more excited. And I've been doing this project for a while now, but I'm getting more and more excited because of where we are in development is I'm getting more and more things that are off the list permanently. It's not like, okay, version one's done, I'll visit version two you know, six months from now. Uh, the damage model system that I'm finishing up in the next two weeks, I mean, it'll, it'll be done, is actually the final damage model system for how damage is uh, applied to an object, how it's able to do transference, how you can have different layers. It, it, it's, it's simple in its implementation, but it allows for incredible amounts of complexity for people to design cool things, new components that, that, that do different values based on the different uh, properties of an object and things like that. And so as more and more of those things come off the list, this platform um, allows for, uh, in terms of bridge building, you know, more complexity. Like uh, Lee keeps talking about, and I'll use Star Trek as an example. If you look at the Enterprise D, engineering section with all of the you, know, you have the giant enterprise cross-section display on the wall you got all the different uh, you know and uh we won't talk about a federation starship that has its shield frequency just sitting on a panel in large letters that just you can walk by and see but that's another discussion for another day um but having a whole room of screens that have nothing to do with the bridge itself but are just around engineering and allowing for you know, I hate the t I hate the term mini game, but allowing for extra depth to an immersive experience that yes might involve something akin to a mini game, but it's more about uh, you know okay uh, the phase alignment on this is out of order now I've got to go over here and adjust that then we've got to go over here and adjust it. and yes it becomes kind of escape roomy, but that's that's really the point uh, at that's the end of in my opinion. Yeah. Um, is you, you're giving them a, a scenario and you've got a whole engineering team that's running around trying to get things you know lined up and, and whatnot. So that's where, you know, when we talk, about, we, we say bridge building, but we're really talking about ship building, aren't we? Because it's not just the bridge. It could be engineering. It could be uh, any part of the ship that we're talking about constructing. If we're talking about like big picture. And I'll shut up again. I don't know how far off the rails I got us, but uh, I give it a five. Fair enough. Since we're off the rails, can I ask, uh, are you still looking for a developer? Oh, yes. So uh, that did hit a snag. Uh, for those of you, you know, I, um, uh, I've had a couple different uh, businesses I've run over the years. I was in the healthcare space for many years, uh, building EVV solutions for states as well as home healthcare 
uh, back end software systems that I wrote from scratch with a development team. I stopped doing that in October. That was my primary focus, like my 60 hours a week job uh, in October. And so everything I did with Horizon in the escape room world was after that. Um, and we're not going to talk about how many hours that was. But now uh, I am full time on Horizons and M3 and Lucky Putt and all my interactive experiences, which is why you've seen the progress. I'm dedicated to this now. Uh, and I have the bandwidth to, do, I, have the, I have the income and bandwidth to, to, to do that. I have the luxury of doing that. And so, you know, it, it's, it's nice because, you know, let, let's, let's be blunt here. Horizon started the very first her, like version of what I, it wasn't called Horizons then, but it was called Star Cruiser Hyperion, was in October of 2012. I started the project uh, in late September uh, of 2012. So, you know, we're in, you know, 22. So you do the math, um, right? But the the version of Horizons that exists today really was 2016. Okay, that's still six years. But really, the, the reality is all of that's every from the beginning to today, it's been part time. Well, till October, it's been part time. Um, whereas now it's full time because uh, I see a lot of potential for this platform, not only for people to, to build cool things at home and create new worlds and create cool bridges and experiences. Um, I, I see very much this engine capable of doing things in the STEM and STEAM world. Uh, and I don't mean Steam as in the 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 store online store. I mean as you know education, um, where there can be a lot of opportunities there. So you'll see uh, us work on that, and then of course the LARP experience that we're working on, which is the Virtual Horizons LARP experience as well as the in person. So I'm I'm doubling down on a lot of this uh, for for many good reasons. Um, so all right, we went off the rails. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, I'll actually use a comparison. So uh, Empty Epsilon actually has a, uh, has, you know, their regular, like, main branch, because Empty Epsilon is an open source project, and then they have a LARP branch. Okay, Th those are two completely separate, like they're, they're genuine branches of the code base. The LARP branch, in fairness, though, is primarily the code base with some extra things added onto it. So it's not like it's a complete deviation. Okay, in the case of Horizons, um, it's not different branches. Horizons is still Horizons, but because of the way the Horizons module system works, the, the LARP construct is a module and nothing more meaning it just is its own separate module that is uh, being worked on, that I'm working on primarily uh, for the LARP experience that has the quartermaster screen, the drone screen, um, as well as a, a, the flight deck screen, which is a, a new station for, for uh, there's a facility in Israel that's using our, that, these new screens and components uh, for a, a physical bridge that they, you know, people come in and play for an hour to two hours. And the flight deck officer can assign drones. So people are actually sitting at two separate drone stations where they built little private little drone rooms where they can sit with a stick and throttle. And they're assigned to one of the shuttles, one of the repair drones, or a fighter that is launched off the horizons. And so you've got up to three different vessels, truly separate vessels. So you have the bridge and then two fighters or shuttles or whatever running simultaneously off the same copy of horizons. That's a whole new ball of wax compared to what we've done historically with multi-bridge. Where I, I, easier than that, um, I will be releasing. Um, I may even put. I, I I'm not, don't hold me to this, uh, but I I'll, I may put it on a um, a source control site um, for the for the LARP one because it's just a module. So it's not like I don't. It doesn't have to be merged into the main per se. It can just be a module that you turn on or off. Well, that's what it is, uh, but I I see the LARP experience is evolving in a couple different directions, and it's strictly something that you could turn on or off um, yourself. So it's really going to be a choice. I don't expect to have it as a native part of the core 
you know, download that you would have on Steam. Could it eventually be a Steam Workshop resource? Sure. Uh, that they could subscribe to, uh, where it's not just the source control. But I, for reasons uh, in terms of some of the things we're going to be doing, because the LARP version will, the LARP module, I don't want to say version because that's misconstrued. The LARP module uh, will grow over time to have other components like officer login and RFID integration and other things that it's it's going to get large in scope, which is a good thing, but it's going to be stuff that your average if you're if you're at home playing with tablets and laptops and a TV, you don't care about that stuff. So I, right. So that that's that's the only reason. Uh, but I, I I feel pretty strongly it's a good reason not to just have it just sitting there in the native release. Um, yeah, you know, that that's why. What, what was that uh, quote? from the reviewer on your website about how this is the most uh, architecturally sound, we say promising or sound. Anyway, it's basically like, of all the bridge guys out there, this guy actually thought about stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, I, uh, I'll i talk about that for a second. I mean, thank you, first of all. That's I very pretty much appreciate that. Um, but I try to think of software design, if I'm the end user, do I want to be locked into X, Y, or Z? Right, um, and the answer is usually no. Right, um, so I always look at that's why I say pla it's a platform. That's why you hear me talk about that. But I, it's interesting. I arrived at that kind of software design philosophy through uh, all the scars I've received living in the government-based healthcare world, where every state has different mandates. And I'm not talking about like mask mandates and vaccines. I'm talking more like their, their IT infrastructure mandates for what data can or can't be stored, what is or what isn't HIPAA. You know, everybody's got their own opinion of X, Y, or Z. And in and without going too far into it, in, in the healthcare space, in home healthcare in particular, and just talking about that, that vein, um, I can have two different agencies uh, based in the exact same city with their home offices across the street from one another where they can sip their coffee and look at each other. Oh, oh, did you? Oh, okay. Um, so the, the, they can sip their coffee and look at each other and, and yet they run their companies completely differently, like 90% differently. And they're both successful, right? Because it, it's a combination of uh, they're they're getting around X, Y, or Z this way, whereas this company's getting around that that way, and they're both dealing with the same legal requirement. But they're handling it differently, and I had to live the life of being the person on the other side of that, the software guy, helping them facilitate both of them existing using the software I had written. So you learn to just make everything configurable. Like, okay, you want you want mileage? Okay, turn it off. You want midnight split? Okay, turn on or off. And that does make for a lot of headaches as the software engineer. I'm not going to lie. But what you get is a platform where somebody just... So, and, and this happens on these chats, and it, it, it gives me... It makes me smile. Uh, or Hemacask will ask for something, and he'll be like, wouldn't it be cool if we could do X? And I was like, oh, yeah, just turn this on. And he's like, wait, you already thought of that? <laughs> um, and so... Um, I, that's what I try to do is that um, is go that route. So thank you for the comment. I, really yeah, like that comment. I charge one license per compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I've been with Dave for quite a while now, and his approaching it as a platform and really understanding what the event architecture, the whole action condition or the condition action system uh, which, which because I've looked at his M3 um, uh, escape room software, it's like, oh, well, you know, that it, this is all the this this is all the same guts. Um, it is it is very cool. Um, I was asking about the uh, about the developer um, uh, just to see what, what kind of you know time frame or how fast things are going to go. Uh, right now, you're kicking ass, taking names. It's awesome, um, and uh, it's. I'm sold on this platform. Uh, just a matter of the time it's going to take to get it to fully unravel or fully, you know, cards are all hit the table. So uh, and I'll say this kind of what Lee's referring to, uh, syntax Leslie, is uh, he's essentially stopped working on all of his ideas for Horizons because he's waiting 
for me to kind of slow down <laughs> I, uh, with the dog. So, I mean, it's a compliment I, and I appreciate it, but it's like, I want to get you back to doing cool stuff, but I know why you're waiting. So because, because I, I'm also talking to the Israeli guys and they're asking, they're just lobbing questions and can I do this and can I do that? And you're responding to all of them and things are happening, things are changing. And I was doing that before, and it's like well, I I felt tired of uh, Dave. Can it do this? Well, it will, but not yet. And it's like okay, let me just let me just back off, put push a clutch in for a little bit, back off, and let you get down the get farther down the path. I will re-engage here uh, uh, eventually. And <laughs> well, it's not. And in fairness, it's not like you disengage. You're engaged here. You're involved in discussion. You're just not getting um, your hands dirty right now on the on developing. The Developing and making missions, and yeah, I'm yeah. Wait for it to unfold. So I mean, there is there is something that falls out of that, you know, specifically about bridge building, you know, at the hardware level, and that is if we're talking about making things into physical buttons, which functions and the roles that they play as physical buttons, you know, is intrinsically tied to their gameplay effect, right? Um, a button that nobody pushes or has a reason to push is, you know, really not much more than set decoration. No, but you want set decoration as well. Do not push. Sure, but it doesn't have to be an actual, I mean, you know. Yeah, uh, I know what you mean. Yeah, you, you, you well, don't need to have the about software for that. About Smuggler's Run at Disneyland uh, is that you've got like four buttons you're supposed to that you can actually do something with on the ride but there's a wall of switches, knobs, and buttons to play with and I'm playing with those buttons and switches the whole time um, And but it's set dressing. None of those things actually do anything. As far as I know maybe they do but but I'm just having fun I, flipping I switches. I do something. I just posted another picture of uh, something. Because I went with the 19 inch rack system I can just take and make buttons and make interface panels, and it just goes into a rack. And I want to move it to a different station. Easy, easy, cheesy. Um, and with like what Dave said, I can put a, a Raspberry, uh, either a Raspberry Pi or a, a Arduino Zero or Nano or something like that, uh, and everything just works. And 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 uh, such a great platform. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say they missed one golden opportunity with that ride in terms of a secret function. And apparently they can, I, I have no confirmation of this, but apparently they can, they considered it and didn't do it because they were tight. were worried about too many people doing it, which is if you hit the corner of the door where the whole, the whole cockpit will, you know, phase in and out, like, you know, where Han Solo is knocking it. Where you just yeah, it smacks the corner. Um, that would have been hysterical if they'd actually d done that. But, so they, they they didn't do it in the end. But... Yeah, that that definitely would have contributed to downtime for sure. Because <laughs> yeah. everybody would have just gone up there and <laughs> smacked the corner constantly. So, um, you know, as you, we're we're having a great discussion, but I, I do feel like um, I want to get back on um, core topic. Um, you know, we've talked about you know general concepts. Are there any direct questions people have about you know hardware choices, um, whether it's the controller for a touchscreen or the button controllers? I know, fried parts. You'd posted some uh, of the different uh, you the uh, uh, human interface uh, you know translators that are out there. I've used um, I, on the art. I, I collect arcade machines as one of my silly and obvious. They're they're very large, obviously. But I've, I've done a couple of conversions where uh, I've used uh, keyboard translators with arcade parts because the, you know, uh, XYZ translator um, board for a battle zone is very hard to find nowadays. Um, things like that. And all of that works. There, there's tons of solutions out there. You've posted several, but all of those work very well. Um, you know, I, I think the only thing I've seen for some of them, depending on their quality control, is they'll burn out over time. Um, depending on the, which one you go with. Like the IPAC is one I've used in the past. Yeah, so that, that I don't know how much electrical engineering we want to do on this talk, but but that's actually, uh, I would say, user error, designer error. 
Um, you can stop that burnout simply by putting a, a 100 ohm resistor in series with all your push buttons. But in any case, I can explain to you why that works. But yeah, well, that's why right. like the um, the i when like the components like the iPack, I don't think took that into consideration because they uh, and somebody might watch the stream and be like, oh, they fixed it. But the ones I've used in the past would like you know they'd last a year and you'd end up replacing them because exactly what you described wasn't really there. Um, at least with the what the core item you had. Um, but yeah, what what questions do people have on on the hardware side in terms of talking about? I, I had a, a couple of sort of community asks to to float out there for feedback. I mean, the first one is um, that that came up earlier about panel design. Um, you know, like what switches go, like what what does the engineering station, you know, consider primary functionality? Right? Like, is there a giant red, you know, eject the core button, or do we want, you know, switches to toggle different states or sliders? I think there might be some at least as practical to me and my construction efforts, it would be very beneficial if perhaps like through some community resource like the wiki or whatever, we maintain sort of a base set of reference designs um, for, you know, this is these are the, the hierarchy of control of the engineering station of the helm of whatever, so that we can sort of put kits of buttons and lights and things together. And, and my aim here is ultimately I'm, I'm looking at some kind of you know group by scenario where um you know we can go directly to some of our suppliers who make you know control parts for real vehicles and power stations and stuff and be like hey look you know all those buttons that didn't pass your longevity cycle test that are basically scrap like will you give us you know a hundred of them for 20 bucks right and then we kind of batch it all together, bring it to the U.S., and kind of hand it out to people in the community who want to, you know, pay the five bucks for shipping or something like that, right? And so by having kind of a standard or some general consensus around how many buttons, what type of buttons go with each station, it makes it possible to make these kinds of kits, you know, very, very cheap. Uh, you're raising, like, uh, I won't comment on the hardware side. I'll comment on the mapping side, which is really talking about per station, like what 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 is available to map first of all i think would be like the, the first item and then and then it's almost like which of these items are the hot items like what are the most common like in, in usage what are the ones that are the most common and which ones have the benefit of having maybe a physical representation um and there is and hemocast can keep me honest on this like we can we can create a um a wiki entry for um keyboard slash joystick mapping you know, what, what are the available hierarchies? What are the ones that are access-based, meaning yaw, pitch, roll, uh, et cetera, that, that have an access, you know, or acceleration, et cetera, and then which ones are literally on-off on states or momentary state um, interactions with horizons? And I have all of that today. Um, it's not available on a list, but we certainly can get that on a wiki. I think that's step one is what it sounds like to me. Lee, you got something? Yeah, so there's this. This has been this has been a not a battle, but a a, um, a topic of conversation for a long time. What you've got is you've got your you know your enterprise with the L cars where everything is black glass and and buttons and it's all touchscreen, and then you've got the you know a 747 cockpit or the start you know a, a, the space shuttle Atlantis cockpit where it's nothing but buttons and you don't you just no way to learn any of it right. And so you've got the, so there's the continuum of the of the of what's going on, um, and so so I took a look I took a long hard look at this and it's like you know for my personal for my personal thing I I don't want it to be necessarily the you know a 747 cockpit, but I want it to be half that I want it, I want to have plenty of tactile stuff I want to have some of the black glass touch screen whatever. And that, like I said, I, I shared a couple of pictures. So, that, so that's kind of the the way I was going for it. Um, and it's also really depending on where you're at in your in your iteration of your timeline in the game. So I'm I'm choosing a very early timeline in Earth's near future, where Horizons in the canon puts it out 200 300 years. Where where the the longer out you get, I would think you would. You would naturally gravitate towards more of the L cars, everything's touchscreen. So it's it's so it's part of your uh, world building 
that you have to kind of stake a claim and then have a, a, an interface set that is in congruent with the claim that you've staked. So um, I think that lines up, just talking about like physical controls, um, I think that lines up kind of what I was referring to. I think that can be a top order uh, oh, a sneeze coming on. Um, and of course it goes away. <laughs> but is you know, here's here's the list of everything you can map to said station, right? That's part one. And I think there there is a smaller list that here's the the good stuff because I think and I'm I've long since forgotten. And Lee, you may remember there was a, a person that did portable bridges that was built for Artemis, but they were triangular shaped, um, and he had lighting at the top, and then there was a small series of buttons on either side with with the screen in the middle. Artemis by design, it, it works with a touchscreen, but it isn't really designed for that. Per, it's not natively designed for that. Um, but what they had done is there were six con six consoles, but each one was different because the button layouts on the sides were different. So you had flight, medical sciences, et cetera. Um, but there were a slew of core button controls on either side um, for every one. But it wasn't every single control, to my, to my point. So it's like, what are the most important things that would be good to have buttons that's a quick access hit? And, and talking about Horizon sp specifically, with the, the newer UI engine that's been in place, where you can now have you know the center area is essentially a, a multifunction display, where you can be the main viewer or your radar screen or your loadout or the, you're on the iris system, right? Looking up an article, right? Um, there is a reason to have a physical button and a build out that is always present regardless of what screen you're on. So there's thought processes there, in my opinion, too, of what buttons are best to have all, you know, always on access, so to speak. Um, just my two thoughts. So uh, I've got some family that just showed up, so I got to bow out, but uh, good talk, and I'll be on next week. Roger that. Take care, Lee. Right. Roger that. I'm also going to go, but I just wanted to say, if you do want to do a group buy on buttons, knobs, and switches, I'm all in on that. So, so let's, um, all right, uh, OK, Taggart's heading out, but let's uh, let's coordinate that then. Uh, we can start up. I do uh, a lot of that stuff professionally, so um, it's this would not really be that big an ask for us to, you know, for me personally, or to use my staff or whatever to help out with, with those kinds of projects. Um, the, the bigger issue is really not the infrastructure to do all of that exists. Um, and we have access to it and can, you know, donate whatever you need. Um, the, the bigger issue is more design, right? Like it's always design, like deciding what it is you want. And then, you know, we've got all kinds of, you know, my my company has offices in China and and other parts of Southeast Asia right next door to most of the control parts makers that at least the ones you would actually want to you know put in your home next to your children <laughs> so non sparking not going to explode not going to you know connect live line voltage through the knob um, but uh, you know the the issue is more like what do we want from them and once we have that consolidated or, or kind of clarified then it's it's just you know, I send one more order in and they, you know, go get it done. Um, the, the, some of the thoughts that I had just really briefly about common controls, as you were mentioning, that I was wanted to ask you while I have the opportunity to speak with you guys. Um, the the issue of multi-bridge um, or, or perhaps single bridge, but with remote crew members um, the, the is the idea of uh, intercoms, right? Um so even in like real vehicles, uh, even if you're in physically the same tank or, or, you know, the same utility aircraft or whatever, you know, for various environmental reasons, you can't really just scream at each other. So, you know, in almost all of those instances, you're connected electronically you're, you're wearing a, a microphone and speakers over your ears. Um, and so, you know, what's common in control panels, like, for example, if you take the Virginia class, just as an example, to, to use a Newport News example, um, you know, the, uh, the, it was the first, 
um, US sub to integrate the sonar stations directly into the main control conformal layout. Um, and one of the advantages of that was that all of the control stations are now homogenized. It's basically a, a comp it's the same furniture, so the same display configuration in front of you, um, and it's the same width and all of that jazz. So the guy who's running, you know, fire control, and the guy who's running, you know, the passive sonar, you know, flank array, as an example, uh, are sitting at the same bench, you know, same looking cabinet with the same displays and things. The only thing that's really different are there's a panel to their right that has, you know, physical buttons for different functions. Uh, I think, um, don't they refer to the any screen anywhere? I think is what they, yeah, yeah. Um, so, sorry, keep going. Sorry. Yeah, and so, so the thing is, but there is, as you described earlier, like a common button panel across all of these stations that's just to the above and to the right of the, the keyboard, and it runs the intercom. So you're using it to select, you know, which channels of audio you want to be bussed into your ear and the relative volumes of those channels. And so, you know, the, the first thought that I had when I started looking at, like, what do I want to do in my bridge was uh, I wanted to integrate a similar intercom functionality so that, um, you know, we may staff only three positions physically in one room, but we could incorporate other players from you know, other positions. And because everyone's communicating with a headset and a microphone, um, you know, the, the, the crew can stay coordinated. Um, it might make sense to have some kind of community reference design for that hardware as well. So, um, and it's interesting you bring that topic up because, and, and this is a rabbit hole, like we won't cover completely tonight by any means, but um, part of my roadmap is to integrate software-wise, natively, video and audio comms into the experience. Um, and th there's two aspects to that. One is exactly what you described, crew communications within the same bridge, right? And that could be all local or it could be spread across the internet, right? Um, or and possibly. Or so, say that again? Or some mix, like some crew members are local, some are remote. Sure, absolutely, right? But but you you're, you you build in a design that supports either methodology. Or, you know, our mixture therein. Um, but the idea is that, you know, part of my roadmap is to have that natively built in with Web, uh, with uh, R, um, WebRTC uh, protocols is what we'll be using. Uh, and we're already actually testing the video side of things. Um, so all of that's coming. But what it's interesting, though, because I, where you hear me hesitating is like, I wouldn't necessarily use that for a local instance a more traditional radio methodology, which I think is what you're kind of alluding to, that might, might be more reasonable for a localized setup. Um, you know, trying to just put everything in software isn't necessarily always the answer, um, particularly with comms. So I think that, that I mean, again, I, as, you, as I was alluding to, I think that's a bigger discussion on where the, the line is for that. But, but I, I feel like the audio video... Or if perhaps like the gameplay could create dimensions or rationale for why you might need it. Like for example, I mean certainly in a in a commercial environment where it's like you know a pay to have an experience type place, you know maybe there's a giant subwoofer that's you know giving you that kind of engine rum or or you know physical right. motion. In which case, physical screaming or shouting or communication might be difficult. Or you know there's environmental sounds and you want to be able to isolate for hearing or things like that. Right. So there could be reasons in in a live environment. Um, but I, I think um, you have two types of comms. You have the one we've been talking about, which is your crew comms. And then you have your ship-to-ship uh, -ship comms, which is, you know, you know, to, you know that, that, that gets what I would call Star Trekian in the you know, on-screen where you're talking to the, your adversary very much like this um, in that style. And, and, but both can be facilitated in, with similar network methodologies from a software standpoint. Oh, and I, on that topic, I'll, I'll divert interestingly. Is I mentioned this, I, I think I mentioned this last week, or maybe the week before, <laughs> excuse me. But one thing we found at MAGFest when we were running the, the LARP bridges and we had the big bridge, and then we had the NPCs, live actors, come up on the middle screen in full Star Trek style where they could talk two-way. Okay, I I had the assumption and it was incorrect, that that wouldn't feel fantastical to them because we live in a Zoom and a Discord world. 
and you know FaceTime and you know th this is extremely common in the world we live in. Uh, but I was wrong. It was still fantastical to them to be in this you know you know you know, quasi bridge environment and having that interaction. They immediately fell into that Star Trek mode, and it was uh, it was cool to see. And I think the same will still apply even if it's in person or mixed or online play. Um, and so I'm excited to see where that will go. Uh, but talking about uh, what we haven't talked about, and I want to go back to something you said about comms, is having discrete channels um, where you can have, uh, you know, I'm assuming you're talking about like, you know, like an overall, like overall comms, for like, like a, a global channel, so to speak, versus individually communicating with one other station directly and think, you know, have, being able to kind of switch back and forth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or, um, or perhaps like when you have multi, in a multi-bridge environment, you know, you have a, a, I communicate with my own bridge versus I communicate with a, a squadron or, or friendly ships, right? Yeah. So, and that's where, that, see, that's, that's interesting. That topic I will tie, tie, kind of dive into, which it goes away from bridge building, but it does tie into the, the physical aspect of building a comms console, which is um, with this audio stuff we're talking about, uh, it does play a role where your comms officer has more to do. And that's in the LARP experience that we built. The comms officer was direct, had a headset and was talking directly to other stations via audio most of the time with some video interaction. But they were doing the talking and then they'd be like, Captain, I, you're just like, just like Uhura in Star Trek. Captain, I've got Starbase such and such on the line, you know, whatever. Um, and it worked the same way. Um, what we found interesting was... We, we did it how you would expect it to work in the real world. Like the, the audio that they're listening to wouldn't just be playing for everybody, right? But from a gamification standpoint, what we found is it's an interesting decision point because the crew wanted to hear it from a gameplay standpoint versus a real world style. They wanted to hear the comms traffic coming in to kind of be involved. Um, so, and, and we, we didn't change it during that course, but it's certainly a, a discussion point because it's like, do you allow them to hear that radio traffic or will it become distractive and whatnot? But every time there was comms going on, everybody would stop and look at comms because they wanted to know, you know, they were like, what's going on? What's he saying? You know, and which like on a real submarine, you're too busy doing your own job to worry about like. You're not in a game. You're actually you've got a job to do. So you, you don't well, I mean, that's that's what that intercom panel is for. So, like, if I'm if I'm on fire control and I I want to know what sonar, I I can listen. This is one of the big innovations of of the what they call the modern submarine, right? Or the NG, the next generation. Um, no, I guess perhaps reference to Star Trek or whatever. But but the thing was so in the in the previous generation of submarines, things like the the periscope right the optro uh, optronics mast as we now call them um was you know like one guy could look through it because it was a tube with mirrors in it right like one guy's eyeballs can fit on the optic piece and see through it but nowadays it's just a camera and you can pull it up on any screen so it it, it leads to better crew coordination when everyone can sort of just passively observe the broad situation around you and the same thing is true of intercom like if you yeah, one of the unique things about the started with the Seawolf class and now the Virginias, at least as far as been publicly declassified, as far as we know anyway, um, that anyone can listen to the sonar system. You know, which which was a huge like what business does you know the radar operator have you know listening to sonar? I mean, they're not trained to to pick up anything in there, but but it's just one of those things that allows you to just have a broad understanding of what's going on and. Um, you know, so those panels allow you to just sort of dial into any of the audio sources and set a, a relative intensity for how to mix that audio into what you're hearing. So, you know, in the case of comms, like you might be able to, you know, like there's just a comms audio bus and, you know, you, you have a switch, you know, or a knob where you can just turn up the volume on the comms channel or turn it down if you don't want to hear it or if it's distracting, right? The, I, oh, go ahead, like. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. You know, I, I love the distinction that you're calling out about 
like I could technically have all the channels on and I just have most of them at extremely low volume. So I can just, if, if nothing's going on on my channel, I can hear the murmuring going on back and forth. And it's, and yeah, I'm going to pull a comment is that they did actually reference a similar construct in Wrath of Khan all the way back then when the ship gets hit and like everybody's messaging Uhura, she wasn't on headset. So everybody's screaming into her console and everybody can hear it. And that's when you hear Kirk say, turn that, you know, turn that crap off. Um, Cause you know, basically turn off everything. Um, because one thing gamification wise, that's going to start surfacing is the game engine already has deck officers and actual NPCs that are in charge of each deck. So that's why when you change alert status, they, you know, some are slow to respond, some are faster to respond based on their abilities. So all of that exists. But what you will see creep into the comm station, which is going to be rebranded as operations, is they will get chatter from the NPCs on each deck. Like if there's a breach, we've got we've got a whole breach dealing with it now, you know, whatever. And so it's um, the comms officer is going to be getting a lot more chatter than just NPCs that are other ships. They're going to be getting all of this traffic that you're referring to. And so where my headspace goes, and this will be audio as well as like there'll be pre-recorded audio for these clips, you know, these NPCs talking like you would have in any game, right? Um, you know, full bridge on deck nine or whatever it is, that kind of stuff. Um, I absolutely see something that I will at least keep my thoughts around as I move forward with this WebRTC implementation I'm talking about to facilitate exactly what you're describing. So that if I'm playing tactical and I want to have the internal traffic on in, in the ship just again as a murmur, why not? I think that's an awesome idea. And it doesn't cost doesn't it will not cost any additional bandwidth in terms of the the what the traffic because if I'm streaming it as one channel, like all of it merged together, it does it shouldn't matter. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's why yeah. yeah. Well architecturally that's why it's important that we have your buy-in, right? Because in order the only way to implement this efficiently is to not have it as truly independent streams. Like it has to be mixed, you know, server side for lack of a better term, right? So that the the bandwidth is equivalent to one audio stream. Well WebRTC does support these kind of constructs where you can merge streams into one uh, network, you know, network resource. Um, I do not have experience with that, uh, but I know it exists. I know it's been done. Um, yeah, so, it's not that hard to do. Right. I mean, it's the WebRTC, actually, they did a lot of things right with that protocol. Um, and you can even, because it's predominantly intended for things like this, right? It's not meant for like an orchestral concert. It's meant for predominantly vocal audio capturing, at least when it, its original specification was designed. You can bring down the the bandwidth of the data packets to a point where you, you can really make it efficient. Um, but I love the concept of not just thinking in terms of channels in the classic sense. It is channels. It is. Uh, but it's it's on a slightly different scope. Um, nothing that's unreasonable is as long as we plan for it. Yeah. Um, and, and it gives you, I mean, to the gameplay immersion experience kind of thing, like when you start talking about physical button panels, like there's nothing more exciting than you know you have you have a, a wall of buttons for controlling all these different sources but then they can light up when there's activity on that you know audio channel or audio bus as we call it in the real world so the uh steel battalions controller um which sits under my desk permanently by the way um but uh there has never been a if, if you've never played with this actually you can find them on ebay and it, it's from the original xbox uh, but it's a brilliant design, and it has your radio tuner dial and communication tuner channels, similar to what you're talking about, more simplistic than what you're talking about, the similar idea. But my favorite button controller on, on any controller I've ever bought is on this one, and it's called, it, they refer to it generically as washing, which is the, you know, it was a translate, instead of it being wipers, which is what it is, the windshield wiper, is when you're in the game and you're you're killing other things and you get blood splattered on your windshield, you literally just go click, and it's and it just clears off all the blood from your windscreen. I was like, okay, they took the time to put a button on the controller just for that. I love these people, <laughs> but it, yeah, well, it's it's still amazing. Like at Magfest, they have four of them because you can still network it locally. 
four together and play the line of sight um, second uh, release and play a local four player land game still to this day. Um, and yeah, what I love about that game is, and it also had the, um, the hardcore campaign mode where if you died, you died. You were starting over. Yeah. <laughs> so the eject button meant, and yeah, the eject button on that has the flip cover eject button. Um, And and by the way, um, who here has it uh, on this chat has an Oculus? Yeah, I have one. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have a Quest or the Rift, the original Rift? I have the original Rift. Yeah. I I, I have I have Rift version one as well. But I I'll tell you, uh, I have a I got a Quest and then I have a Quest two now as well. Um, there is a game for that that I would tell everyone to get if you have a Quest, and it's called um, uh, Iron Rebellion. And it is very much a spiritual um, successor to Steel Battalions. It is simpler than Steel Battalions. I'm not I'm not putting it on the same level, but it has a startup sequence system where you actually have to use your hands to flip startup buttons, and then you and then you grab each of the controllers, uh, and you have a very constricted view because you're in a mech cockpit, so your view out is this window, and so you look, in, huh, iron. Iron Rebellion. Okay. Um, and then you have little, like, literally armored slits on the sides that you can peek out of because it's armored so you don't get hit, right? But I can see barely out of my side views. And if you lean forward, I can look further out the corners because I'm leaning forward towards the edge of the cockpit. But it is, it, it is more arcade action right now um than what steel battalions represented which was more of a simulation you know with sim with steel battalions if you got going too fast and you tried to turn you would literally fall right on your ass uh because you you know you, you the momentum would just carry you flat out right your gyroscopes couldn't keep up this game has some of those mechanics and they're I, I feel very strongly that's where they're headed it's in an early ac early release early access i think it's the um the uh, oculus um app lab is what they call it but they just implemented four versus four. So it's four on four. And it, it, it's mostly deathmatch type stuff, but they're adding more and more and more different weapon types, different loadouts. But it is very much that Steel Battalion's feel um, in terms of just basic gameplay. So if you have an Oculus, a uh, Quest, uh, grab it. And I actually, uh, if you have, it might actually be on PC too. Um, so don't rule that out, but it's great. It's good stuff. I, I love where they're going with it. I, I hope if, if they get to, or if they're able to complete their vision, it will essentially be a Steel Battalion's replacement because they'll have a full campaign and everything. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, but talking about um, and and like that that right there, uh, we were looking at that you know that that controller um, having well actually I'll bring it back out because this is really poignant to talking about startup screen or startup interfaces as it applies to the consoles that actually we're talking about. Like with this one, to start it up, you actually had a startup sequence that if you got it in, out of order, you have to start back over again. Um, having the things like, I joked about the washer button, but there's things in Horizons that we should be able to do something similar with where it seems trivial, but in reality, it's it's something that's fun and, and give, provides interesting depth to the game. You know, you know, the most fun ones are the are the ones where the sequence goes across stations, right? So people have to coordinate. And yes. with vehicles, it's uh, it's easy enough to come up with, you know, diegetic reasoning for why that's true. I mean, right, like you're, when you talk about like bringing power online, most systems have some, you know, like have a design limit that is built around their nominal or steady state use. Whereas when things first start up, they typically use a lot more power than when they're running. So you have to, you know, start things in a certain sequence in order to overwhelm, you know, I mean, there's a, a nice, you know, sequence that most people remember from the Apollo 13 movie when they're talking about how to do the re-entry startup in the Apollo spacecraft, right? Um, which is a, a classic illustration of this phenomenon. So, you know, it would just be a lot of fun. There's also um, at the, uh, Houston uh, museum part of the the uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston. Um, there is uh, one of their displays has one of these type of games. You know, it's just a sequence game, 
Um, but you know, like one of the, one of the stations is, you know, the operations. One of them is, you know, power. One of them is, you know, et cetera. Yeah. I have this book. This was my favorite book as a kid. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, uh, and you know, it like, yeah, it has all the panel layouts and all the switches and everything. Of course the last iteration of the shuttle had more screens than switches, but, um, but yeah, the fact that, and you had all the different, you know, all that. Yeah. I love this. I've talked, talked about this book on some of the Zuzi chats before. Uh, but I, for those of you who don't know, I am a two-time Space Camp alumni uh, from the 80s. Um, Me but, too. Represent. Um, I only got to go once, but and from the 90s. But yeah, I did uh, 80. I was Space Academy, uh, Space Academy level one in 87, and Space Academy level two in 88. And uh, I'm actually um, a member of the board of directors for the Space Camp Alumni Association. So uh, made it out to Huntsville earlier this year. Hopefully I'll be out, or early last year, excuse me, now that we talk about that. And then uh, we'll be out hopefully uh, this year for Alumni Fest. So uh, big space nerd here. But but to, to the point you're making, and I was kind of alluding to, what I think for future discussions, because um, we're not going to get through everything tonight, but that's that's a good thing. That's That means there's a lot to talk about. I think there's three categories of physical interfaces that can be applied to stations. One of them you alluded to, which is common controls, right? These sets of controls will be present regardless of the station operating, right? And then there's a set of uh, focused controls that are explicit to a station. And then I think there's a third category, which still falls into the, it's a branch of the second, but it kind of goes into the category of what I was referring to, like with the washer button and things like that, where, um, borderline, you know, saying unnecessary is unfair, but controls that are, are there for depth, you know, visual depth in terms of there being more controls available. Uh, but if they weren't there, it wouldn't be a problem, but they're there to provide extra, again, visual depth as well as um, just, a, you know, a fun factor. Gamification, I think is what I would call it. Um, I, th I feel like those are the three categories. Would anybody disagree with that thought process? Um, well, I would think some you keep some of the the third category also for LARP extra things for the LARP modules. Sure. Um, but yeah, the typical ones for us when we design simulators, uh, we we divide controls into three groups. So they're they're what are generally called simulation masters. Meaning these are these are controls that control systems that are meta to the simulation itself. Like they turn on the power to the computer that runs the simulation, but in the simulation, the vehicle may still be off, right? Like you have to hit the simulation button that, right? So you have you have those simulation masters, then you have the simulation controls themselves, and then you have the um, the simulation auxiliaries so that's that's things like lighting ventilation you know like because you're in a physical space and not a virtual world like there are still some things that physically exist in the simulation environment that need to essentially output real phenomena right like an example might be like uh, in dcs which is a flight simulator right you know you're in the cockpit of the airplane the airplane has switches that turn on fans that do nothing more than blow air on the pilot Right. So if you're just playing a game, that button has no real purpose. But if you're in an actual environment simulating an airplane, then flipping that switch in the virtual environment, turning on an actual fan, you know, has an effect and a purpose. Right. Right. Yeah. So and I, I think right, and from a gamification standpoint, I think that that. That fan one you mentioned falls into what I would classify that third category I was referring to. Um, it, it, it is about providing depth of gameplay, but it isn't essential to the simulation experience. So that that lines up kind of with my thought process, and um, that's really good. Yeah. And I mentioned it earlier, but we, we talked about physical controls, but I think, uh, let me loop back to something you were alluding to very early on in this discussion tonight, which is not just physical controls, but feedback, be it lighting, um, status lighting, uh, or alert lighting, um, where the console in question 
could have, um, you know, alert lighting is easy to bake in. I mean, that's, you know, th there's easy ways to do that. But, um, you know, lighting controls for is autopilot on or off is um, are shields up or down where it's just a physical light, but it, it's a, that tactile feedback. So when they hit a button, that light comes on. It It's again, that, that immersive experience that, and we all know, uh, no, no different than that museum piece you were talking about. People will go in game and they're not even in a combat situation. They'll just sit there and hit the shields up and shields down button to watch the light go on and off, you know, um, just because it's fidgety. Um, <laughs> but I, I think um, there's no there's dimensions of simulation like motion, um, which may not directly. I mean, like nobody's going to build a giant, you know, multi-ton gantry system that can rock a whole bridge, right? But but you can get. Hey hey, <laughs> hey 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 hey! I'm actually working on something in my trailer, so maybe. <laughs> That's amazing. But but there's um, some simple analogs to that, like like putting um you know low frequency tempers on their chairs or under the keyboard of the console, so as they're touching it, or even into like behind the display, so like as you get hit or the ship is you know rubbing against an atmosphere of a planet or something, you know the display will literally be difficult for the human eye to maintain focus directly and playing on, right? So I have it, it's interesting you bring that up because I have not turned it on. But uh, like for those of you that know in the gameplay, uh, if the ship explodes or crashes, uh, the, all of the screens crack and there's a shatter sound. So like and it, it's it's hysterical watching people for the first time when that happens to them because it scares the hell out of them that they've just broken the console or, you know, and I've had people panic that they thought they just broke this expensive piece of equipment. And, it you know, anyway, but it's that kind of feedback. So that was that's audio and visual. But that same cue there's nothing stopping us from letting that also be a thumper or like you said some kind of physical feedback where the console essentially you know uh vibration feedback um and all of the um all of the occurrences in horizons be it an explosion the ship being hit the shields being hit uh all of that data is available to the consoles so if we wanted to implement uh, those messages that are getting to the consoles to be translated into visual or physical occurrences, the data is there today. Um, so that opportunity is something that it's not, it's not something you have to wait on me for. It's something that we could bake into a design today. Um, and so there's opportunities there. Yeah, I, I built a design for, uh, or did a design for, um... A friend of mine who was building a some kind of flight simulator, I think like an F sixteen or something like that, and uh, he was just looking at these chair base thumper things that are you know fifty to hundred plus dollars once you buy the amplifiers for them and whatnot. And he was like, "Look, can you make this but really cheap?" And uh, it turns out that at least the design I came up with would would cost about ten to fifteen dollars to do and. Uh, and when he built one, he said it worked fine. So there, there are some contributions, perhaps, that we could make as a community to to some kind of standards of reference designs for these types of experiences. Oh my gosh! Me. Yeah, I um, I don't, I, I might still have mine. I don't know. Um, certainly not boxed. Does but, it have uh, some kind of lever that just like smacks you in the back when on command? No, it's it literally. He's not kidding. It's like a, it's like you're wearing a backpack. Um, yeah, it, it's not it's not the the haptic type stuff you see today. It's much more rudimentary in its design. But for the time, it was pretty cool um, with what they were doing. Um, you know, it's it's a, it's it was a more extreme version akin to what they do in the controllers nowadays with the the vibration feedback, really. Um, so similar, um, but uh, but yeah. So so bottom line is all of that message control data is available for us to do those those kinds of things, um, and so 
you know, we're at 7.30. I want to be mindful of everybody's time. Uh, I, I have no problem going till 8 o'clock. I'm happy to keep going. Uh, but I do want to kind of let, let, let us kind of wrap up at 8 for everybody's evening. But so we got, yeah. Okay. Yes. In fact, um, you let what I was about to say with the time we have remaining, what I wanted to actually kind of put in motion is, um, and we, we've still got like, you know, 25 minutes or so till eight o'clock. So we have plenty of time to keep talking. But I wanted us to be mindful of before we got to eight o'clock to think about next steps, not just next discussion, like to, but like what would be helpful. You've just outlined one that I think is a great first step in terms of you know, because it's interesting you brought up that that methodology of like minimum footprint, medium, and then, you know, if I have a million dollars, what could I build kind of thing, right? Um, but I always envisioned to write, like from the very first day I started working on it, I've always envisioned Horizons as a, like a BYOD, bring your own device kind of methodology, where if you all you have is um, a computer monitor and a bunch of laptops and you're sitting around together on couches, rock on. If you've upgraded to tablets with a bigger screen TV, rock on. If you've got a place where you've got a projector and DMA, you know, when you start upgrading, like the, the software should scale to the level of experience you want. Uh, fair. So what you're really saying is not just put it in bridge building, but have it available in a, in a different area for people to access uh, that aren't necessarily on Discord. Um, Yeah, but I, I like the thought I don't ask a potentially sensitive, oh. slightly diversionary topic. So, so the question here is, uh, what would there be some, or is there some structure where there we can potentially generate revenue or some kinds of lifetime support for the project by having a, a, an official store that perhaps sells, you know. DIY kits of parts for this or not. So, um, no, I don't think that's a sensitive topic at all. In fact, I think that lines up with um, some things that we have talked about in the past. Um, there have been requests similar to what Lance brought up, but but more direct is, is there a place I can just buy a bridge? Can I just buy right. a Yeah, exactly right. So the point was like, you, you could just sell it like, here's a parts kit. Or you can, you know, for... Fifty hundred dollars more per station or something like that. It's also available, you know, pre-built, pre-painted, or something, whatever. Right? Like, there's a, you just essentially add a layer of uh, community. Uh, I don't know, centralization is that a word? But the point is, to have some uh, official source where we can amalgamate all of this hardware, software, firmware, and and direct game support. Right? If you buy this kit, you know that it will work. Right? It will do X, Y, Z functions and you know, you can mod it yourself from there or whatever. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think that's a perfect topic to bring back up. I, we haven't visited that topic in some time, but I think I think we're there. I think we're to that point. And I have no objection to exploring that. Um, I think step one is coming up with a generally agreed upon list of minimal hardware. I, I, really, I think Lance ca categorized it well where you have kind of the bare bones, if I want to be able to run a bridge, what do I need? Or what can I buy, right? And if it's X number of tablets plus this plus that, and you're done, and then you, you go up from there. Uh, and Right. And if you have a million dollars, call me first. Um, 
So what what I would say is this, um, like this this is I, I don't know to not co-opt anything, but it's like my big dream is to do essentially exactly that. So um, I have for a number of years been thinking about you know various like panels and things because I wanted to build something for my kids, um, and and you know I all day long I'm doing various forms of control panel work and systems architecture designs and things like that. So it, it's just a natural professional area of expertise for me and a, a personal interest area. So it aligns. And, um, you know, my company has warehousing and distribution and, you know, global access to suppliers and stuff like that, which all of which I'm more than willing to, to donate the warehousing space and staff time and whatever it takes to just make these things available and to, you know, store them and distribute them when people want. Right. Um, and we can, you know, forego our profits and donate whatever, you know, a few dollars in order or something that we would normally collect for distribution. We can, you know, directly dump that in the horizon coffers or something as a, as a contribution. So there's, there's some architecture there that I think would make sense and fulfill a lot of these community needs. Um, you know, yeah, what I, for that. You will hear me a willing participant to like, like, let's talk it through and see what, what's plausible. Um, because, you know, I've always considered this a group create. Uh, yes, I am the sole, currently, that's a sole developer. It was asked earlier and we kind of got off topic, but I am actually expanding the development uh, pool for Horizons. Uh, Mythric, which is my company, is in the process of hiring a new developer. Uh, that that took a, a, a holding pattern after the October events that I mentioned earlier. But that is being revisited here by the end of first quarter. Um, so there'll be other devs to really continue to ramp up what we're doing. Uh, but if you've got, if you've got the infrastructure and plausibility to be able to do what you're describing, uh, I, I'm on board. And if it's just something where we work out where uh, the cost involved, um, there's a percentage to you just for your time and effort and, and trouble. And there's a, you know all of that we can work out. Uh, you know that that's all. Uh, you know, fine tuning of the idea, but I think, um, so I, I love it. I, I, I say, let's, let's keep talking about it. I, I think the next steps beyond this meeting are figuring out what those, um, and I, I think Lance's, uh, concept is fine. You know, there's a price point. Um, and I, I think branding wise, what you do is you come up with the different price points and then you kind of create a name for that price point so that you're associating it with, you know, casual bridge, me whatever whatever we want to call them we come up with a naming convention for it but but you do it based on price point i think that's a perfectly reasonable ask um i think we need to start looking at what those tiers are and what and what hardware is involved in those tiers i mean is the bottom you know is the bottom tier tablets is it laptops because everybody you know most gamers are going to have some kind of a laptop like, what do we consider bare bones bottom right uh and start there as a baseline and move up because I, 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 and again, I don't think that's for this chat. I think that's for further text chat in the channels as well as other Tuesday nights. But I, you know, we need to say what's the bottom? Is it tablets or is it laptops? It's going to be one of the two, I would say. Um, you know, it could be Raspberry Pis. I wouldn't rule that out either. But it's going to be one of those three form factors. I mean, anybody can disagree with me, but I think you're going to start at one of those three points. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know, your your average art, like, in the Artemis community, in the Epsilon community, it's very common to have older laptops that, you know, people buy in bulk to use. I will tell you, I'm not a fan of that construct as it applies to Horizons, because it cripples what you can do, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I mean, and, I mean, the flip side is, if you buy older desktops, I mean, you can get like an insane amount of computational horsepower for you know a hundred bucks nowadays right like if you buy a just buy a, a cad desktop from 2008 right and you'll have 24 cores and and 16 gig of ram for you know 100 bucks so just for reference the 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 portable bridges that we built that have the um the gator cases in them, the actual cpu that is running those bridges is a 2006 Mac Mini boot camp, and it runs it flawlessly. Okay, uh, you don't need uh, you need you need a I mean, and, and those had good graphics cards for their of, of their time. They you know, you're not running crisis on them, but for what what we're doing computationally, it's, it's we're not 
we're doing more than MTF Salon and Artemis, but it's it's still not, you know, we're not going absolutely batshit crazy with the GPU. So you can do this on older hardware very effectively. In fact, a Pi 4, which is is newer, I grant you, but it, its graphical computational power is pretty low compared to, say, even an Intel 440 from 10 years ago. It, you know, that, that'll smoke it, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, but uh, it'll run a console fine, and it even runs the 3D WebGL version at about, at full screen, so 1920 by 1080, uh, at about 30 frames a second, give or take, uh, which ain't bad, folks, not for a pie. Um, and I, I built in ways for the WebGL to be scaled down so you could actually scale down the render resolution and get more frames out of something like a pie. Um, so, you know, those aren't off the table for things like this. Now, for a main view screen, uh, no, I would have something that has, you know, that, that you know is going to render fine. Um, but for consoles, no, you don't need to spend crazy amounts of money for those. You just don't. Um, and like, uh, yeah, that, that that's another it. group buy yeah. item. Actually, might be a touch touch screen, right? Like, I think that's the thing most most people struggle with is finding reasonably priced mid size touch screen. So. Well, 14, talking, 14 to 24 is the technical term used in right, right. That, a monitor it's a monitor size not a tablet size is what i would say um or it's more in line with a monitor scale um but like what we in the version one of our bridge um there was touch screen we used um hands-free touch screens which were not all in ones they were just touch screen monitors with these guys and this is a amigo i mean it's just it's a windows stick is what this is it's just a windows yeah. stick this one is this one is 11 years old, by the way. So this is running like a dual core. It's equivalent of a Celeron of its era, and I, this actually could run Horizons the server. Mm -hmm. Do it. Um, but we were sticking these in the back of these hand sprees and running uh, consoles just fine. Um, I am finding Acer as a brand. Uh, we have two different types of Acers for our touch screens today. We have all-in-ones that we got that were refurbished, okay? But we got them for between two thirty and two fifty a piece, okay? Um, they are now seven years old, but are still rock solid as consoles. I mean, they're they're more than more than capable as consoles. Uh, what the most recent bridge I've purchased, which you can find on on eBay uh, as uh, refurbished. Are Chrome bases, which is Chrome's version of the Chrome OS all in ones with touchscreens. And Acer makes a brand of those as well. Um, they were used heavily in education and they're seeing they're they're being cycled out. So these things are four years old as is. But again, um, to give you an example, uh the the Chrome bases actually I would say run better than the Acers. Of course, they're newer, uh, but they were running 60 frames per second, silk smooth. Uh, the WebGL rendering, and they also support. Here's what's cool about the Chrome bases: they support natively a second monitor. So I could plug in a second monitor, and it would run both off of one system. So I have one thing powered up, one Ethernet, and then I have two monitors. And we did that for the Deluxe Bridge, where we had the alert status and shield status were running off of other Chrome bases, and they were, and I was getting butter smooth frame rates. Uh, now those are around the two hundred dollar range when you find them refurbished on eBay. Um, and there's a couple of resellers on eBay that, that do them in bulk as they get, they're obviously, you know, um, tech dumps where they get them from educational sectors and then just clean them up, flip and flip them. But I have had great success with those. Um, so, but, but those are both, those are both what I would call, you know, all in ones, right? They're complete systems. Um, the, the, the part that's more logical from a long-term perspective, is getting a touch screen and then powering it via a Pi or some, you know, your you're, you're separation of concerns, right? So if the PC shoots, craps the bed, the monitor's fine and vice versa, right? Um, so and, and the computers will evolve significantly faster than the displays will. Of course, of course. Uh, well, and especially like the fir very first touchscreen displays we had were HPs and they were the, uh, 
the IR based. So, you know, they got, if you got them dirty or if the sensors got clogged, they were a nightmare. Oh my God, they were a nightmare. Well, the worst um, thing we have with those um, is when users who aren't familiar with how they work will stick their hand too close and then it can't find the touch yeah. point or it will use the centroid of like a, two touches and like, you know, click somewhere you don't want it to click. But now that they've gone to, you know, your the modern multi-touch displays that have been around now for a while. Once they got to that, the displays themselves, the touchscreen displays, uh, to your point, have a certain amount of longevity to them where you can upgrade the power behind it pretty easily. Um, and there's also opportunities, by the way, uh, really when we're talking about the mobile bridges, to do uh, PoE implementations as well, where um, if you're going to wire your Ethernet, you're running power across that as well. We've done that with our Pies in the past. Because um, we used to have full Pi bridges, and as well as the Windows Stick bridges. We've done both. Um, we got lucky with finding the Acer brands that were all-in-ones for a good price. I would say, in terms of getting touchscreens, I've had success with the Acer as a brand on eBay as refurbished models. Brand new stuff, you're not going to find sub-500. You, you know that's that's new off the shelf. Like the the Acer models we got refurbished were six seven hundred dollars new, um, and I think that price point's probably still consistent uh, from my my experience. I don't know you know fried parts what you've seen in the OEM world for touchscreens, but well, we the 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 stuff that we're doing is is usually raw component integration. So we buy the actual LCD panel and we buy the CTP panel that goes on top of it. And then, yeah. uh, you know, either sometimes we don't even bond them. You know, sometimes it'll just be like for for maintenance. Uh, a lot of times, uh, the CTP panel is just by the bezel design, like kind of secured directly on top of the display. So if somebody destroys the panel or the it you know wires in the panel break and you need to replace it, you can keep the actual LCD behind it. Um, you know, so there's there's that. I, I, that's what I'm saying. Like I think there's an opportunity there for you know the community to sort of come together around one or two different form factors for the displays, and then we just go to those suppliers and make a sort of a group buy proposition. Um, you know, we want 50 panels, but we're only going to pay you know. 20 bucks each or something, you know, but we're not time sensitive, you know, slot us in where you have surplus. Uh, we might be able to swing some kind of deal like that. Okay. So I guess, um, so I, I think next steps are, um, as a community, you know, I certainly will weigh in, uh, and you know, the, the folks that have been on this call previously, like Taggart and others that would definitely have thoughts will weigh in. But let's, in the Bridge Britain channel, let, let's kind of, as a group, come up with that, what do we think the minimum tier really is? And what the, what's that form factor? Is it laptops or not? I don't have a strong opinion. Um, but I do, you think ta tablet just so that you have the touch screen as a baseline? Yeah. My concern there, and the reason I, I, I talk about the other form factors is, if you're going, if you're starting at tablets, that means you're. If if, if I'm buying like Starter Bridge and I get tablets, which are inexpensive, like there is a mo cost model there that that you can do inexpensively, right? But if I'm going to go from that to something else, I'm not going to go backwards. Like anything I'm going to do after that's going to have to be touchscreen at the next level, right? Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. So all, all so your jump from a tablet bridge to a, you know, desktop touchscreen experience form factor, the price point's going to jump significantly. So I wouldn't make that a... And may, maybe I'm overthinking this, guys. Maybe the tier one is there's a couple different options and different form factors. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Oh. Well, you, the, the most common one is the 10-inch form factor, whether it's an iPad or the, the, the Fire tablet or the... Um, yeah. You know, um, yeah, I have six iPads, uh, three Gen, Gen 2 and three Gen 7 that I use, uh, no problem. Um, and, uh, I mean... Yeah. So, I, I guess... But...
but I think that's I think that's the professional production. Your starting point is not going to be what we're referring to, in my opinion. If you're doing yeah. this professionally, you're going to be at one of the upper tiers. You're not going to be at this bare bones tier that I'm referring to. Yeah, but maybe no. bare bones tier has uh, is a similar price point, so we stay in the same price area. But hey, if you want the tablet option, here's the because it may be here's your form factor, ten inch tablets here. This cost here's your overall cost for X number of tablets and you know a PC to run it. And then, but if you if you want a larger form factor, maybe it's re, you know repurposed laptops that have fifteen inch displays, right? And you may be getting repurposed laptops that have touch screens, not unreasonable. Um, and then you know, so so I, I think there's some different form factors that we can fact pun intended, factor in to the starting bridge tier. So maybe we don't lock ourselves into the starting is tablets or the starting is this or starting. This. We look at the price point and say, you have these three different at this price point. I think it is fair to say the starting is probably the most difficult to have this conversation. And once you start creeping up the, the chain, um, you're going to touch screens, you're going to physical interfaces, you're going to, you, you're, what you're going to be constructing is going to be more consistent. Not necessarily the exact specifications, but... Well, you know, there's, there's a reason drug dealers give out free samples, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> the first one's always free. Um, yeah, this is true. So... Absolutely. Oh, we, we do. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what I, a valid point to raise, that's perfectly valid. I think my, my point was more that if I'm, if my primary interface is going from the 10 inch tablet to a larger, like a 24 inch touchscreen, I'm upgrading, but that tablet can then sit to the side and be a secondary screen. 100% true. Breaking my stuff, man. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. But I, I think that that is something to factor into that path. Is what do you do with the tech? If I've moved to, if I started with bridge set one and I've moved to to to, to tier two, what can I do with the tier one stuff in tier two? I think I think that's also something that we can talk about. Um, I just want to get a starting point so that we have, you know. Tier one is the here's your options. And here's the price point involved with that tier, um, and then I think that will inform for us. It we've just said it. It'll inform for us how you get to then what does tier two look like? What's its price point? And then reusability wise, as you creep up each tier, all of this tech can be reused as you move forward. Even if you get to the much higher tiers, uh, and yeah. you're going to be like with with a professional commercial grade. Um, if you go all the way to that, all of this can still be reused. I mean, um, beauty. Tablets, moving them to a mount on the captain's chair for his captain's map and control right there. Yeah. Um, for example. Um, uh, that too. I mean, you can use it for lots of things. All right. So. No, that's great stuff. So I think. Um, I think that's what we kind of, and we can forge ahead in the bridge building channel with this discussion. Um, I think what I can own along with um, those that are contributing to the wiki is as we start to formalize what these tiers look like, we will get that on the wiki as kind of a source of truth. Um, and then I think uh, fried parts that will kind of head and form what on these tiers, you know, the we talked about what need, what are the needs, right? What are the button needs? What types of buttons? What types of you know, are we talking toggles, momentary push buttons, et cetera, et cetera? I think that will start to inform that list, um, depending on when we get to certain layers, and then we'll start to formalize, like you said, like here's a common set. Like a, a perfect example is like I'm redoing all the lights in my Adams Family pinball, and I can go to um, you know. Uh, pinballspecialties.com and I can get um, the Adams Family LED pinball set. I can just get a set of lights that are the exact set of what I need to just replace in that. Um, the same would be true is like 
if you've got a predefined list of here's all the, for, for this layout, here's all the flight controls, here's all the components you need in a Ziploc bag ready to go. You just pay for it and you've got everything, you know, in one bag. I think that's where- Yeah, that, that's the dream, right? Like they're just, just panel modules. And then at, at the same idea, it just becomes like any other mod to the Starship Horizon environment. I mean, people can contribute those ideas too. And, um, you know, certainly, we can, or, you know, if you hate us, you can find another provider. But the point is, like, we can provide the infrastructure behind that. So, you know, community send a design, some authority agrees that, like, this is the one that enough people think is, you know, worth buying or provisioning. And then we'll go, you know, kit the parts and keep them in stock and people can buy them if they want them. Right. Yeah. So uh, that makes sense. Where you basically the modules that we got is pre-configured to work with said panel. Um, that that's something that certainly is plausible. Um, there there is going to be a layer to that where there'll still be some customization at your level uh, to set up you know custom controls and and. You know, yeah, you know, the traditional stuff, no different than any flight. Fair. Yeah, I, I think that's reasonable to talk about. Um, and uh, I will I'll wrap up with this uh, as potentially a future discussion tied into the not just the physical layout, um, but their uh, science Rob, who is is a um, a fabricator. He, uh, he does tons of escape room stuff. He's a, he's a pro in that space. He's amazing. Science Rob, you're amazing. Um, he uh, has the facilities to um, to cut out ma machine cut uh, panels and other things that could be prefabricated to fit the button layouts as well. Um, so if we come up with, and, and you may have that as well, Fred parts, I'm, but, but point yeah, we, is, we have uh, CNC, laser, and uh, and press. So okay. those three processes we have. That's on the table but, there. But too. again, like we don't have to be the primary fabricator of those parts. We're, I think, the the primary utility or contribution we have to the community is going to be on the sourcing, getting, and distribution side. Right. Um, so so there are options there, but I think that's part of this discussion. Is here's the buttons, and here's a. Uh, layout for those buttons already pre-done. Do you want that panel as well? Yes, I'd love to already have that panel. And it's built for say a 24 inch monitor implementation. So it, you know, it goes over top of that, et cetera. So you, and then here's the monitors we know that work with said panel to, to fit plush. Like, you know, these following touch screens work, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, I think that the wiki here could be really powerful. I mean, generally I, the way I imagine it would be that we we release it kind of as three levels. So there's there's the reference design, meaning all the design files, you know, as you know, PDF dimension drawings plus you know, 3D CAD versions, etc. So you can take those as a starting point, design your own stuff, and have your own fabricators make physical panels. You know, the second layer is the the physical hardware kit. So you're getting all the switches and displays and whatever, um, so that they're aligned with those dimensions. So you can, and then the third layer would be you you buy it as you know the panel, the parts kit. And the software just you know plug and play complete build solution yeah okay well guy as usual this has been an awesome discussion uh a solid two hours uh i welcome us continuing this discussion uh as a future session uh but i think in the interim let's continue this chat in the bridge building channel um and again as we formulate these tiers we'll start getting that reference material in the wiki, not just as the starting bridge price points, but also as you referred to the layout dimensions and CAD drawings, whatever, you know, whatever resources we want to make available for them, because I can easily see here's the buttons we making are making available for the flight station, but here's five different panel layouts, uh, you know, that the community has come up with, which one do you want? And you can put them in that configuration. Uh, and all of that's, you know, many over time, I think we all would expect that to grow, to be more 
um, you know, to have more options as you go down the path. So I think that's going to be good stuff. All right. Any uh, any fi final parting shots, parting comments? Um, yeah. wonderful it was nice to meet everyone, by the way. So yeah. Absolutely. Same I here as well. Much. Okay. I, I take that as a compliment. I genuinely do. Um, but the future is bright for that because um, when the damage model stuff is done, I mean, that, that's a massive part of the the complexity of the game engine in terms of how things interact with each other in the world. That's that Once that's done, I literally, other than tweaking something or bug fixing, that entire component is done for the life of the product, um, which is a pretty bold statement to make, honestly but I'm pretty excited about it. So um, when things like that are closed and I'm starting to work on other things, the reality of there being a more reasonable starting point for somebody who's waiting for me to do all the cool stuff, um, you, you have a, a more a, a safe starting point where the game isn't changing so much on you because I'm not doing 100 things every release. Um, and we're, we're getting close to that, honestly. We really are. Um, because with WebGL is dangerously close. Right before we got on this call, I was doing um, the new particle systems for uh, the engine exhaust as well as explosions. And I've got to finish up uh, the projectile mapping so that it, those are animated. And the WebGL renderer will be just as capable and in some ways better than the classic renderer. Um, and that will be, quote unquote, off the list as well. And I had that on my original roadmap as an end of product item, like end of the life cycle. I've switched that entirely to sooner because it's going to facilitate and talks talking about bridge building, the ability to have port and starboard windows where they're rendered off a of Raspberry Pi and you've got the star field, you know, uh, flying by. That's the actual view out of the ship from that actual port, right? So, um, and because the WebGL renderer can do all of that, you can have, as, and that, and the, whatever's powering said view is what's doing the actual 3D rendering work, not the server, you can, I mean, that scales unbelievably well. Um, there's so much you can do with that. So uh, that's why you've seen me refocus on that, uh, the WebGL renderer, because I have really repurposed my thought process on the long term of this product to be more, the, where the server is more of a he truly headless computational server and everything else is done on the clients. And then you then then uh, by the way, and it only runs on Windows today. But the moment I do that, you I am enabling Linux and Mac OS immediately, just just by decoupling from a DirectX Windows you know rendering architecture, I, I immediately open myself up to to the other platforms, uh, which is another discussion entirely. All right, uh, again, guys, awesome as always. Thanks everybody for attending. We will revisit this topic on a future chat, uh, and I welcome everybody to chime in in bridge building, and we will keep on trucking. Everybody have a wonderful evening. Yeah, take care, and thank you for your time. I appreciate uh, you doing this for us. Oh, I appreciate uh, your input as well. It's going to be very valuable. I think everybody's excited. Thanks, everyone.